lead story today, Walmart. Now, everyone knows that Walmart is a low-cost retailer, but not everyone knows that customers banking within Walmart do some of the most expensive banking in the country. Now, Walmart banking customers pay extraordinarily high fees, a large chunk of which come from overdraft charges. Now, a Wall Street Journal analysis of federal filings found that the five banks with the most Walmart branches ranked among the top 10 U.S. banks in terms of fees as a percentage of deposits. Basically, many Walmart customers intentionally overdraw on their accounts. Take Wood Forest National Bank, for example. Now, on a $300 overdraft withdrawal, the bank would take the borrowed sum plus an additional $30 fee. And while that might be cheaper than a payday loan, if the overdraft were actually calculated as a proper loan, the annual percentage rate interest, or APR, would be over 300%. So, yeah, not cheap. Now, what's interesting in all this is that the banks operating within Walmart actually seek out individuals who otherwise might never have access to banking. They want folks with bad credit histories, and they encourage overdrawing on accounts. Roughly 78% of Wood Forest fees come from overdrafts and bounced checks. Now, there are programs that can help customers stay within their limits and avoid bouncing checks, but at Wood Forest, employees often advise customers short on cash to take out their entire overdraft allowance at one time in order to only be hit with a single overdraft fee. Now, if that's what they call a program to help encourage customers to employ better banking practices, it's a pretty terrible one. And sadly, for many chronic overdraft users, fees are just the equivalent of a short-term loan with ultra-high interest rates. But this practice traps customers in a cycle of debt. And now, I understand that Walmart is a low-cost retailer, and for that, attracts shoppers seeking lower costs. However, allowing banks to operate in their establishments that then prey on those very customers is just wrong. Actually, worse than that, it's bad business. instability can have reverberating effects throughout the economy. That is why it's important to keep abreast of global politics in order to manage your risk and investments. The ongoing conflict in Ukraine can possibly lead to economic shocks that affect Europe and the emerging markets. And although it's not clear what will happen, it's a good idea to keep an open mind to what might play out. Now, here to walk us through the future scenarios, at least some of them, is Gerald Salente, author, trend forecaster extraordinaire, and publisher of the Trends Journal. So, Gerald, welcome to the show. And first and foremost, um, you know, I want to ask you, uh, on this show, I've described the conflict in the Ukraine as worryingly close to civil war, essentially. Worryingly is, I guess, the best word that we can use. But how do you see the conflict there having developed? And second, can it be won? I'm sorry, the first part of the question was? How do you see the conflict there having developed? Oh, having developed is very clear. And by the way, in our Winter Trends Journal, uh, back in January, we said it would devolve into a civil war, and it was the cover story. It developed. It's very clear, if anyone takes the time to listen to the Assistant Secretary of State, Victoria Nuland, on December 13, 2013, at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., sponsored by Chevron, and she's talking about how when the demonstrations first began there and how that the future of Ukraine is with Europe, which is news, of course, to the people that are closely allied with Russia, and that the path set for them by the IMF is the path for them to follow. And then, of course, there are the infamous Victoria Nuland tapes and those of the American ambassador to Ukraine, uh, Jeffrey Pyatt also talking about the overthrow of Yanukovych and replacing him with, quote, Yats. And, of course, that's Yats in Europe now. So it's very clear how this began. And tracking trends, by the way, is an understanding of where we are, how we got here, and where we're going. And as we can see the where we're going, the United States and Europe, which were the two major players in this, because there was also the element within this of Ukraine going with Russia for their deal of $17 billion in loans rather than going to the European Union, which the deal was sub supposedly set for, forth before that. And I say they overplay their hand because they never anticipated on losing Crimea so fast, and I don't believe they anticipated 
the unrest going on now in the eastern sectors of Ukraine that are of the Russian origin and Russian language. So where it's going is this is a totally volatile situation that the United States NATO has absolutely no control of and of course neither does the illegitimate government that was installed after the overthrow of Yanukovych have, have the power to suppress. So this thing could spread. It's out of control. And unless it is controlled, this could be the beginning of something that's much more horrific than anyone's anticipating. Gerald, what do you think the economic impact will be for Ukraine, the U.S., Russia, and the world, for that matter? Well, Ukraine, I mean, when you go back to this, that was one of the major issues already. Ukraine was an economic mess to begin with. And, you know, we're looking at a country, by the way, that with, a, with a GDP the size of what? Alabama? You know, and, and it's going to affect Russia worse than the United States if the sanctions go in place. And it's going to also hurt Europe because there's a lot of trade going on. Most of the trade goes on between Europe and the United States. It's uh, excuse me, uh, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, Russia and, and the European Union and not the United States. And of course, there's always the gas and oil issue. So it's going to hurt that region the most. And at this, it's very important at this time that there's no economic recovery. You look what's going on in Europe. You look at the debt levels in private debt and public debt. It's not as though these are boom times and anyone could afford worse times. So they're playing with economic fire, and they're playing with the fire of war. Gerald, you're an advocate for peace. So how do we dial back the rhetoric and achieve a peaceful solution in Ukraine, given the geostrategic and economic objectives here? Well, it's, again, you know, I'm up here in Colonial Kingston, New York. It's the, one of the building blocks of the American Revolution. The 1777 Senate House is literally a stone's throw away. Every fa the Founding Fathers, Washington's farewell address, no foreign entanglements, Franklin, Jefferson. Who are these people to say that we have to be involved in other countries' business? You look at the news today, and the warnings are coming out from the UK, the US, Germany, and France, warning Russia not to be involved more in Ukraine. Who made this stuff up? I mean, look on the map, you know? I mean, you're talking about between the United States and Mexico and Russia and Ukraine and, and Russia and Mexico and the United States. I mean, there's no, it's none of our business. And I'm sick of these Harvard, Princeton, Yale guys with bad attitudes and women that are telling me what we need to do as the we is, of course, the young kids that go fight and die. And so what they're doing is they're over their heads these are the Georgetown, Washington, Beltway people that think they have the strategies and the wherewithal to dictate what should go on in the world. And all that they have, Aaron, don't listen to me, look at the facts, is a track record of major losses and defeats. The situation in Ukraine could be calmed down very quickly if the United States and Russia and Europe stay out of the way and let those people settle it themselves. If they want to kill themselves, that's their business. It's not mine because guess what? We got a lot of problems over here that we can't fix. I have to ask you, Gerald, is this a new Cold War? Again, I've been writing about this for years. Yes, it is Cold War 2.0. It's the neocon agenda where they're trying to, de trying to keep weakening Russia, expand American hegemony, and surround. The United States only has three countries standing in its way of total hegemony. It's China, Iran, and, and Russia. And the neocon agenda is to weaken all three of them. And when you look at China and you look at the United States, you can see the difference in the countries. The business of China is business. The business of the United States has become war. And the economy and society is suffering for it because the money that we're wasting abroad is really needed to rebuild America as we're in decline. 
Now, obviously, the U.S. wants to project power, but in your view, what is the economic impact of U.S. foreign policy used to maintain global hegemony? Well, Europe, Europe is a puppet of the United States. I mean, you know, what are they going to do? They always fall in line. Go back to the Afghan war, Europe fell in line. It wasn't they who pushed for it. Go back to the Iraq war. You remember that coalition of the willing? <laughs> it was the United States that pushed that forward. You remember those non-existent weapons of mass destruction and ties to al-Qaeda. And then you go to Libya. It was the United States that initiated that along with France. So again, what you have is you have the United States as the main power and NATO and Europe really just doing the servants work for the United States agenda. Gerald, we have to take a quick break, but please don't go anywhere, and you don't go anywhere either out there in TV land, because Gerald Salente is sticking around, and when we return, we're discussing the three Ds, deflation, debt, and default. Then in today's big deal, Edward Harris and I are looking at the ultimate in high-flying luxury. But before we go, here are a look at some of your closing numbers of the bell. Stick around. Nothing has been done this complex by the military since World War II. This is, quite frankly, in historical terms, the Berlin airlift in reverse. We've already seen a 747 go down in Bagram, some load shifting on takeoff, cause aircraft to become unstable and fall. You're talking really billions of dollars to move billions of dollars worth of equipment. At what point is the cost no longer worth the investment? What are your thoughts on what's been going on in Washington? Well, it's a mess, Larry. I mean, the whole country is being scoffed at and laughed at. Enough is enough. F the media, f the candidates, f the corporatocracy covering issues that actually affect you and me. It doesn't do too much for ad revenue. Biotech agriculture giant takes on a 76-year-old American farmer based in Indiana. How much fallout do you think this is going to create for the CIA? Do you think this is what's triggering the crisis? America's the largest economy in the world. It's also the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. Breaking the set is mostly about alternatives to the status quo, but one that gave real alternatives a voice. A minute they were working toward the American dream, the next they were just trying to survive the night. It's time for Americans and lawmakers in Washington to wake up and start talking about the real causes of poverty in America. With more from Gerald Salenta, and I want to pick up right where we left off and ask you, Gerald, do you think we're likely to see secular and economic stagnation? No, I really don't. Not not in the in the sense of, of the secular stagnant uh, economy, in the in the sense that you know they they keep revising what it really means. Uh, it used to mean uh, low population growth and slow technological growth, and then that was revised by Larry Summers to mean low GDP. Yes. Uh, the boom days of the United States are over. You know, we're in the sixth year of the Great Recession, and the only people that are benefiting from all of the quantitative easing, record low interest rates, are the investors, the private equity groups, the hedge funds, the venture capitalists, the Wall Street players, and the big banks. So yes, what you see now is what it is. And you saw the retail numbers that came out today. They were roaring hot. 0.1%. And, and they can't blame that one on the weather. Right. So you're, what it is now, it's an America in a steady decline. It's in front of everybody's eyes, and no one wants to call it what it is. And they, oh, the midterm elections are coming up. How could I forget? <laughs> like, that's going to change anything? So no, it's going to continue on a downward spiral unless policy is changed. Now, Dallas Fed President Richard Fisher says rates will remain low in the U.S. as long as there's no chance of government-measured consumer price inflation hitting 2%. So what's your current thinking on the direction and effect of monetary policy in the U.S.? Well, these low inflation rates are historical. Nobody's ever done this before, and they're hurting all of the people. When I was a young man, 
There used to be this very strange thing that they used to have and encourage people to do. Open up a savings account in the bank. <laughs> and you used to get more interest than the inflation rate. That's gone. So people, they have, they, they have nowhere to put their money for safe savings. And, and, the, and this thing of keeping interest rates low, as I said, is only benefiting Wall Street and the equity markets. And not only in the United States, around the world, whether it's Japan here or anywhere else. So no, this is a very destructive policy that is just dumping more cheap dough into the system and not, and not looking at the problem at all. Now, in Europe, a lot of people are afraid that deflation could mean debt deflation, default, and depression. I mean, that's a lot of D words, Gerald. So what's your, what's your take? I'm not a believer of this deflation cycle. I don't know what world they're living in. <laughs> but, I mean, I don't know about you, but the world I live in, gasoline prices keep going up. Oh, our energy prices up here in the lovely Hudson Valley? In March, in February, in January, they went up 38, 40, 50 percent. I don't know what world they're living in. The food's getting a lot more expensive. Rent is almost nothing. What are they talking about? You know what they're talking about? They're talking about rigged numbers. And anybody that watches the inflation numbers know that the numbers aren't reflecting the real world. There's no deflationary cycle, as I see it. Okay, now there's been a lot of talk about bubbles and bubbles popping up in the technology world with loss-making companies like Twitter and Tesla soaring and then crashing pretty hard. So is there a bubble and where is it? I see the bubble as well. I believe there's a techno technological bubble. It's different than the one back in the dot-com days, but it's very similar as well. Back then they didn't have anything to sell or they weren't making anything and markets were just going up. But you take Twitter for example. I mean, how many, you know, who, who buys ads on Twitter? Who sees them? And, and the whole, in Facebook as well. It's not as though you're, the, the ads are registering in your mind. And the, and the whole online world, for example, as soon as an ad comes on, man, everybody knocks it off as quick as they can. So I believe there is an, it is overextended. You're looking at the NASDAQ. Take the NASDAQ, for example. What is it, like 4,100? You know, back in 2000, it was 5,000. Mm -hmm. So when you were really put in for inflation, you're probably down about 2,000 points. So I, don't, I see a bubble, and I see it as a big problem. Gerald, what about new era technologies like Bitcoin? Are you bullish on Bitcoin? You know, that again reminds me of the days back when uh, the dot-com bubble. It was something that I used to have trouble. I'd watch these shows where they drag out 16-year-old kids with their parents, and they talk about the wonderful you know, new technology. It never made sense to me. This doesn't make sense to me either. There's something about it that's not right. I mean, if you can't trust the fiat currency, are you going to trust a digital one? And we saw what happened with the, with the great crash of the Mount Go uh, a little while ago. And that was the biggest trader of bitcoins. So it could happen at any time in any place. Having said that, it's also been legitimized at some level by the IRS saying that it can be used in retail. But that means that if it's used in retail, then you have to pay a tax on the profit of what you bought it for and what you bought with it if there's a profit from it. So, and, and, then, and then the other problem with it, Aaron, is that the whole world has, is coming up with a different formula on how they're going to allow it to be traded in their country. So I see it as something that's a bit shaky to me. Now, given your views, uh, which investments look most promising to you at present? Well, I would have to say that I was very, I was bullish on real estate for the last three years. I bought, I bought a property with a 15-year locked in at 2.875. You know, but you can't keep interest rates low forever. So I think the real estate market is going to, it's going to really soften up. And we're seeing it already. Uh, for me, the, the major investment opportunities, I'm still a buyer of gold, by the way. Not right now, I'm a holder of gold, not buying more yet. But for me, it's long term for my golden years. And they're coming close. Bazing. But anyway, <laughs> I like that. The, uh, the, for me, anything with food. Huh. Food, water, health. This country, by the way, it's not Obamacare that's going to be the problem. It's I don't care.
This country has become the most obese country on the planet. You're going to see major, major problems, and there's going to be movements for solutions. So anything having to do with whole health healing, anything having to do with clean food, organic, anything having to do with water, and anything having to do with micro farms, all of that, that's going to be a big future. And, and as I keep saying to me, the biggest is going to be when they come out with a new alternative energy something beyond wind, solar, geothermal, or biofuel. That could be the big game changer. And I believe the brain power is there. It's just not the will. For example, what did we spend on the Iraq and Afghan war? They're totaling up now to about $6 trillion. You think if they put six, if they put a trillion dollars into developing a new alternative energy, if they could split the atom during World War II, you think we'd have one now and that would change not only the entire civilization on how we live and what we do, it would also change geopolitics in a big way. Because as I said, go back to that National Press Club meeting right. in Washington, D.C. with Victoria Newland. There she is, right next to Chevron, a $10 billion deal go. done a month before. It's crazy stuff, Gerald, and I agree with you on, on you know, no, no more trillions in... in foreign nations. Let's keep it at home. But that was Gerald Salente, publisher of the Trends Journal. Time now for today's big deal.